everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to the session on innovative financing in the education sector in India. I have a fantastic power pack panel here with me today. Some great friends and colleagues that we'll be talking to. Um, I will just try and set up a few uh, ground rules for the session today and then we will get right into the discussion. Um, the session today is quite technical, so we will cover quite a few different approaches um, on how innovative financing has been used and can be used in the education sector and with a deep focus on India. We will be talking a lot about impact bonds. We will be talking about other blended finance approaches. We will be talking about uh, how loans can be structured in interesting ways to drive learning outcomes. Uh, the panelists will also focus a little bit on how COVID has impacted their work, uh, not just in the short run, but also how are they thinking about it in a more medium term way. And then really going forward, uh, you know, what is it that we as a sector, what is it that we as a group of stakeholders really want that can change and what can drive much more mainstreaming of innovative financing approaches going forward. So just to kick things off, uh, have we just switched presenting a couple of slides? I'm part of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, and uh, we've been in India for over 15 years. Uh, we've invested over $200 million across multiple programs. We focused a lot in the education space as well as financial inclusion and livelihoods. And um, our work reaches over 30 million children and their families every year. Uh, this topic is something that we are extremely excited and very bullish about. Uh, you know, we believe that this is something that can truly, truly transform the sector. Uh, it's a sector that has long thought about, you know, enrollment and uh, very input focused indicators. And we, for a long time, have struggled to move the conversation to learning outcomes. Uh, somehow, I think in the last couple of years, many things are starting to come together. And uh, we see that there are many more players in the ecosystem that using these blended finance approaches can actually start to focus on common metrics of student outcomes. Um, we've also over, you know, the last 13 years of having worked with multiple partners in India, you know, seen models that have worked, seen models that have not worked. And we feel that these approaches now can actually take models that have demonstrated success and help them scale up with much more innovative sources of capital. And uh, we also want to expand the market. You know, it's not just about philanthropic capital, but it's also about looking at many other different types of capital coming into play. So more funding, better funding, uh, looking at commercial capital, impact investors, and how people can really come together to transform the lives of our kids and make education outcomes a reality for them. Um, and, you know, that's... So I'm going to just set up the panel today. So we have Sandeep. He's the founding partner of uh, Kais Invest. They're an education-focused investment fund. We have Maya from the UBS Optimus Foundation, who has led um, you know, three large impact bonds in India, two of them in education, and we will hear a lot more about them in today's session. Emily is a fellow at the Brookings Institution at the Center for Universal Education. Um, again, Brookings has been really leading the charge on bringing together multiple stakeholders, trying to play the role of really uh, collating and pooling everything that we can learn from these instruments and how we can make them better and more efficient. And we also have Steve, we've had the pleasure of working with him for a long time at the foundation. Uh, Steve is the co-founder and CEO of Vartana. Uh, they are largely a school lending company and lend, provide loans to budget private schools. He is going to cover some interesting approaches of, you know, the business that he works in. What are they seeing and how they have managed to take a very tough market and start to incentivize people towards common outcomes. Uh, we're going to start off with you, Emily. Um, and Emily is going to provide us a little bit of a background on how uh, the blended finance market, uh, you know, what kind of innovative financing structures exist and, you know, specifically where do impact bonds fit in. Emily, just let me know when you would like me to switch slides.
Great, thank you so much, Amar, and thanks so much for the, this opportunity. Thanks to MSDF and to the Central Square Foundation. It's great to be with all of you this evening, morning, afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll jump in just to give a little bit of uh, background. Uh, Samar mentioned we've been researching uh, innovative financing as it applies to education and as well as other sectors with a particular focus on uh, impact bonds. Um, so impact bonds, I'll, give a, I'll kind of give a brief uh, 101 on impact bonds. So they're a form of uh, payment by results. And um, just to give a sense, you know, they're really one form of innovative financing. Um, they are a type of payment by results where um, we have multiple types of payment by results which differ in who holds the risk, the operational risk. So you have results-based aid, performance-based contracts, performance-based loans, um, and development and social impact bonds fit within that category. So we can go to the next slide. So we usually describe them as uh, a combination of three things, uh, impact investing, public-private partnerships, and uh, payment by results or results-based financing. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll describe how they work. Um, <clears throat> so by now, many probably are familiar with, with impact bonds. Uh, first of all, they aren't bonds, so um, not, not such a great name, but a name that I think we're stuck with, but they're uh, a type of payment by results, as I, as I mentioned, in the United States, it's called pay for success financing. And how it works is that uh, investors, usually impact investors, provide upfront capital to a beneficiary, to a, a service provider who then delivers services to, um, to the beneficiaries. And then an evaluator verifies whether or not some agreed upon outcomes uh, have been achieved. And if those outcomes have been achieved, then the outcome funder, outcome payer, uh, pays the investor back their principal plus some return. In the case of a social impact bond, that outcome funder or outcome payer is the government. In the case of a development impact bond, the outcome funder or payer is uh, a third party, such as a donor agency or a foundation. Um, if those outcomes aren't achieved, then the investor uh, can lose uh, their investment. And so the, the, the point here is really shifting that risk from, uh, from outcome funders, the government or the, the um, or the donor agency or whoever is the outcome funder, um, but also uh, that operational risk shifting it from the uh, service providers, which uh, in the case of traditional results-based financing, often service providers are um, bearing that uh, operational risk. So these are the three kind of key players that you have uh, in impact bonds, the investors, the service providers, and the outcome funders. But then you also have uh, often intermediary party that puts these uh, that helps to structure the deal and um, help kind of bring everybody together. And then you also have the independent evaluator, often a legal counsel, um, and, um, and sometimes a performance management entity or performance management uh, intermediary that works closely with the service provider around uh, improving systems of data collection and monitoring and evaluation and performance management. So we've been uh, collecting data on the impact bonds market for about five years. Um, so we have a very comprehensive database, uh, which really allows us to understand the characteristics of the impact bonds market, the size, um, you know, how these uh, structures are governed, and how the market is changing over time. So as of uh, the beginning of this month, we count 193 impact bonds that have been contracted globally across 33 countries. Um, 50 of those that have been contracted uh, have now um, reached a close. So there are currently 143 that are active. Um, and those impact bonds um, are, the majority of them, as you can see, um, are in the UK and the US. Um, there are 17 impact bonds in developing countries. 11 of those are development impact bonds and six are social impact bonds. In the next slide, we can see uh, the distribution across sectors. So you can see that the dominant sectors are uh, employment and social welfare. Um, the yellow on the left with 63 is social welfare. Um, and then there are two 
in the education sector. So, sorry, 22 in the education sector. If we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the education sector uh, looks like. So, um, so this is all, all of the impact bonds uh, across the world. So as I said, there are 22. Um, the majority of those are in Portugal with eight. Um, and, um, and how they're distributed across the education, um, across the education is also very interesting. There are four in pre-primary, uh, 12 in primary, five in secondary education, and two in tertiary. And then at the bottom of the slide, you can see how they're distributed in terms of the, who the focus is on. So um, you might notice that these numbers don't add up to 22. That's because some of them have a focus on, um, on multiple parties. So there are four that have a focus on teachers, six that have a focus on families, and 16 that have a focus uh, primarily on, on um, the students. But again, they may uh, work with students um, and also have a teacher training component or with, work with students and families. Um, and then we also um, looked at uh, how many are in ed tech and there are about seven uh, that are in the ed tech sector. Um, and, and as you'll notice, and so of the ones that are in developing countries, um, that's, uh, we have two uh, in India, um, which you'll hear more about um, from Maya, and, um, and then one in South Africa, which is for early childhood development that works in um, slums of Cape Town. Um, and that's a social impact bond, so with the government as outcome funder, um, and um, they are providing services in homes uh, for children preschool uh, preschool programs. Happy to talk more about that one if there's any um, interest or questions. Um, so, um, so as I said, we've we've been following the impact bond market now for for five years. We really have um, you know close relationships and uh, with the you know all of the different stakeholders across the world. And so, and we've been really been following these and really so when. COVID-19 hit, we were really concerned about uh, the impacts that this would have on um, the one, I think it's about 1.2 million um, beneficiaries that are receiving services within impact bond structures. Um, so we put out a quick uh, survey to about 20, between 20 and 25 um, different impact bonds um, across across sectors uh, and across the world to get some, some responses on, on sort of what's happening. And so we asked these questions, what are the impacts on the beneficiaries in their communities, um, you know, within what the intervention is providing, but also more broadly, um, what does service delivery look like now? Have they had to terminate or have they found some ad adaptive approaches to deliver services? What's happening in terms of outcome achievement or what did they expect um, might happen in terms of outcome achievement um, and the impact on if there's an evaluation happening. Um, and, um, and then, you know, have the investors considered put in, putting in additional funding? Have contracts uh, been extended or will they be extended? Have targets been adjusted? And then what sort of are some early lessons learned? So um, we got uh, very thorough responses back from from the different stakeholders and found it really interesting. And I think we found sort of kind of three, three main things that, that kind of stood out. Um, so we were really curious, I mean, uh, you know, clearly in terms of the impact on the beneficiaries, um, you know, uh, if, if we focus on the education ones, you know, obvious concerns about learning loss, but also, you know, many issue, other issues around, um, you know, uh, well-being um, and mental health issues of domestic violence arising with children being in homes um, and um, you know food insecurity uh, etc so as well as early you know risk of early marriage teen pregnancy you know kind of all of the risk factors kind of heightened uh, in this crisis state um, so what did we learn um, so our kind of our, our really uh, big question was: Are impact bonds do they fare differently? Does this the services that are receiving service are, that are receiving funding 
through this different financing mechanism, do they fare differently than um, traditional grant-based um, funded projects? And why do we think that that might be possible? So impact bonds differ from traditional grant-based funding in a number of ways. Um, and what's really, what really came through um, with kind of three things came through. One, um, that because impact bonds are focused on outcomes, and there really is a lot of flexibility al allowed around the inputs and the process, um, that um, the stakeholders in our rapid survey responded that indeed, um, they're finding that they have this flexibility to course adjust uh, in the face of, of this crisis. And so they're finding alternative ways to deliver services um, through mobile phones um, uh, or other means uh, to deliver their services to the extent possible. Um, and that's really allowed within this uh, structure. And, I, and we did hear that you know, uh, in other projects that are traditionally grant-based funding, that are funded through grant-based funding, those kinds of things are happening as well, but I think that the shift to, the, the, um, to do this is facilitated in this impact bond structure. The second that's, thing that... That's I'll, I'll interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the, the second thing is a strong uh, governance structure um, and collaboration that exists within the impact bond structure that has really been beneficial. Um, and then finally, the performance management systems are helping to collect needed data to understand what's happening um, on the ground and where you know, particular attention needs to be paid. Um, there are some other challenges as well, and perhaps later in the discussion, uh, we can get into those. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Emily. And I think it's heartening to hear that some of these approaches provide more flexibility. Uh, Maya, maybe I'll just uh, hand over to you to talk a little bit more specifically about the education impact bonds in India. You've led both of them. Um, and then I think one thing which would be good for the audience, and those are some of the questions that I'm picking up, is how do you see that these are maybe more superior to traditional grant-based structures? You know, what's the secret sauce that's making these impact bonds work? And then, you know, cover a little bit about the COVID impact, both immediate as well as Two years down the road. Thank you, Samar. Thank, thank you, Emily. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, let me just start by just giving you a little bit of background about Optimist Foundation. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, so we were created about 20 years ago by the UBS Bank to help clients have more impact with their philanthropy. So we've impacted more than 13 million children worldwide over the past five years and provided over 525 million US dollars to date. I think we're in a little bit of a unique position as a foundation to really bring in more and better funding for development programs, particularly by providing catalytic funding to drive impact for the most vulnerable. And um, wanted to go through a, a few of the types of innovative financing tools that we've um, piloted and start with impact bonds building on Emily's uh, great introduction. Um, so, as you also mentioned, so we've been involved in all three impact bonds um, in India, two in education and one in health. Um, in the education space, we've also invested in one in South Africa, focused more on skills training and, and tertiary. So, let me zoom into, uh, and zoom, zoom into anyway, into the quality education um, India Impact Bond. Uh, so we co-designed it um, with um, MSDF and British Asian Trust. It's the largest impact bond in education to date. It's about 10 million in size. And it's focused on improving learning for about 200,000 children in Delhi, Maharashtra, UP, and, and, and Gujarat. Uh, as Optimus Foundation, we're the lead investor. So we're pooling funds from clients and investing into four different implementers with different models, ranging from school leadership development uh, with Kevalia to remedial classes with SARD, whole school management, Gyanshala, or EdTech with Pratham and MindSpark. So really different delivery models, all with the aim of improving learning outcomes for children. Emily mentioned some of the potential benefits of impact bonds, but we really had five main objectives as we co-designed this. Um, with MSDF and BIT, who are also the outcome funders in this transaction. 
So really the first one was how can we start shifting from activity-based to more outcomes-based funding to help deliver better and more consistent impact? The second was how can we start acting as a proof of concept for government participation in similar vehicles? So Emily mentioned development impact bonds and social impact bonds. Can this be a, a, a blueprint for uh, government participation in education impact bonds in India and elsewhere? Uh, the third one is really increasing and diversifying the pool of available capital for high quality programs. Um, and then fourth, like as a foundation and, and with other foundations that are also involved, how can we build evidence around what works and what doesn't work so that we can then replicate this going forward? And, and finally, um, how can we use this to help determine what is the most cost effective way to allocate future funding in education? So, so far, um, the program is a four year program. The first two years have yielded really positive results. And as an investor, we're on track to reach our 8% um, internal rate of return. The implementers overall have reached their targets, but we've had to make some changes in the implementation models and reallocate funding when targets couldn't be reached. So really that active performance management and that um, constant course correction has been uh, critical um, and will continue to be, as I will talk a little bit about uh, the impact of COVID uh, uh, later on. But beyond impact bonds, I just wanted to give three more examples of models that we've supported in education. So one is a 12 million education facility with Acumen in East Africa, aiming to invest in education social enterprises. We've provided loans and equity investments coupled with a grant for pre and post investment support and an outcomes based incentive, or some would call it an impact carry, for both the investment manager as well as the investees if they reach their outcome targets. That's one example. The second example I'll mention is um, income sharing agreements for young people who, for example, can't afford tuition fees for higher quality, uh, higher education. And beyond financial support, these students would gain financial literacy skills, job readiness training, and an active alumni network for lifelong career support. Once graduates start working and earn above the minimum income threshold, they make income-based repayment for their loans. So the benefit that students draw from their education is also evidenced by their employment outcomes, which in turn then defines the amount that they pay for their education. Last example that I'll go into, and, and you alluded to this uh, uh, summer as well, is looking at flexible ways that we can give out loans. So we talk about impact loans to social enterprises where the interest rate fluctuates based on the learning outcomes that are achieved. Um, an example that I'll give is um, Educ Plus uh, in the Ivory Coast, which helps caregivers support their child's education, even if they themselves are not educated. So simple online platform that schools can use to voice message parents and teachers. It's a using artificial intelligence um, to bring parents closer to their children's school life and to support teachers with suggestions of very simple activities that they can do to improve learning in the classroom. And there the interest on the loan has a sliding scale which dis decreases as learning outcomes increase. So just a few examples just to show the range of options that we have in our tools uh, to, to drive learning outcomes. And all these examples have one thing in common, I think, and is that, that we aim to have social outcomes actually drive the financial returns by providing all stakeholders incentives to improve learning. Um, but now maybe just to reflect on how COVID has impacted all of this. Um, so in the short term, obviously, program delivery is being modified using remote and distance learning solutions. But learning outcomes, particularly for low income uh, families and children, will, won't be the same um, as classroom delivery during this, this hard time. So I think what we need is, is very, I'll call them frugal innovations. So very simple remote solutions that can reach children with poor access. Um, so maybe like radio, that's been implemented by one of our grantees called Rising Academies or voice -based, voiced content like the one I mentioned earlier. So simple, frugal um, innovations. And from our experiences with impact bonds like the quality education dib, I wanna just maybe echo something that, that um, Emily mentioned earlier. 
that, that, that flexibility in program delivery really helps in a time like this. It allows implementers to make program modifications to achieve education goals, um, even though th there probably will be an impact on outcomes, but at least there's that flexibility to constantly modify. And I think we've also been really encouraged by the positive response and collaboration amongst the funders, because these contracts can really bring um, funders together and, and reaffirm their commitment to the program goals. So yes, there are some short-term challenges, but I do think there's an opportunity for a paradigm shift in how philanthropy and public spending are applied to achieve outcomes. And, and I think impact bonds and outcomes-based funding can really come in here with, based on basically three key features. One is it shifts payment timing so that funders who are strained now can pay later. We pay for results, so it allows for money to be hopefully reallocated more eff efficiently and effectively. And it can bring in different types of funders with different profiles. So investors might be looking for opportunities that are uncorrelated with financial markets. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to thinking a little bit about uh, more about the future and, and how these initial pilots and tests might, might be able to be mainstreamed. Thanks, Maya. And I really liked your thought around frugal innovation. I think we all need to put our heads together on this one to really see how we can very quickly repurpose and actually continue to make these programs more effective. Uh, Sandeep, over to you. Uh, you know, no introduction is needed to Kaizen, but I think it would be good for the audience to understand a little bit about the portfolio. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen if you give me a minute. Yep, thank you. So while you do that, I must thank uh, Dell Foundation and uh, Central Square Foundation for inviting us to be a part of this pretty impressive panel. I have been in listening and enjoying and learning a lot from the last two speakers. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Maya. Really appreciate it. I think uh, the, the this is a time where whenever you're ready, uh, Summer, I'm I'm ready to go. But while she while you display the slides, uh, while um, you may have heard of Kaizen, we've just, just changed our name just to surprise you a few months ago. We are now called Kaizen Best. And uh, we are a very focused investor in education. Steve represents uh, one of the companies we've had the fortune to work with and learn a lot of lessons from. So thank you, Steve, for all the lessons we've learned from you and Dell Foundation. We work with you uh, as part of that effort as well. And a lot of what I'm gonna speak about is uh, related to the lessons we've learned. We are, uh, as uh, Summer mentioned, an education-focused investor. We made investments in 14 companies most of them in India, across various segments, and a couple across Vietnam and Philippines as well. Uh, this has been possible for us because we've been able to take some of the lessons we've learned in India and apply in Southeast Asia. As you can see, we've invested in multiple companies across preschools, schools, uh, universities, test preparation, skills training, English language learning, and other enablers in education technology. And one of them that stands out is Vartana, which is a good focus for what we are gonna talk about today. Uh, next, please. So we think that uh, education is right at the center of what the world can use to, to change the world itself. When we first started Kaizen about 10 years ago, our motive was to really improve education itself. When people asked us what we wanna do, we really want to bring the best affordable quality, meaningful, relevant education to the people that benefit from our investee companies. But over time, as we matured ourselves as Kaizen Best, we now believe that it is our purpose to change the world through education. We really think that we can leverage the strength of learning and education to bring confidence to people, to bring better gender inclusion, to bring better employment and productivity, innovation, sustainability, and overall that leads to wellness of social kind, emotional, financial, and overall well-being for everybody. Very altruistic and uh, quite idealistic, but we've got to start somewhere. Even if we believe that we want to attack climate change, if we educate our uh, generations over the years, we might even understand why that is important. So I think we are at a point in our lives, next slide please, where uh, as we speak for it, we understand that one of the most difficult segments of education is actually at the bottom of the pyramid. It has been 
tormented by multiple challenges, political, regulatory, financial, etc. And it takes a very strong uh, government and equally strong entrepreneurs to come together to create a viable, sustainable uh, structure at the bottom of the pyramid. To us, the bottom of the pyramid is a critical part because that is where the ma majority in the developing markets learn, particularly in India. And uh, without getting into the pros and cons of public and private or state or non-state learning, what is critical is that both have to work together. And as both work together, we realize that there are opportunities to learn from each other, but the definition of non-state education has to be arrived at very carefully. Within non-state education, there are low-cost schools, low-cost institutions that provide education to a significant minority of the learning population today, and that number is growing. The schools, uh, let's just focus on that domain. The early childhood development centers and other economies, schools, let's say in India, represent uh, about a fee structure of under $100 to a great extent a year. And if you expand the fee structure to up to $500 a year, which is pretty high, then you start getting into a bulk of the private schools in any country, particularly in India. And those schools have to be strengthened. And how can we work in a manner such that innovative financing can come and support the growth of those schools from one center to two, et cetera. What we realize is that many of these schools are started by entrepreneurs who have um, maybe in the past been teachers and really been passionate about providing better quality education, have spun out and started a school. Uh, finance is often not the forte. So providing financial guidance along with finance and support is often an important part of how a financial structure works at the bottom of the pyramid with such entrepreneurs. So we call this segment affordable learning providers. You might hear other terms as well, but we'll uh, use them interchangeably as we go forward. Next one, Summer. So when we started Kaizen, we started with a focus on equity. That was the simplest way we could think of investing in education. As time went on, we learned a few lessons. One of them was that to a great extent, the there's a significant fallacy in the investor's mindset that you could perhaps effect more change and improvement through equity. The, real, the reality is in a market where the owner of a school doesn't really imagine parting with the school ever, in fact, imagines that the school will pass on to the next generation or be its permanent structure beyond his or her lifetime in society, having an equity investment starts to make less and less sense. So what does make sense is debt. That is something that we can viscerally relate to. And the discipline that the debt brings in, the expectation of return that the debt brings in along with it is much more meaningful and more achievable and doesn't put unnecessary strain on the owner, the entrepreneur. And that in, result, in, in turn results in a much better stress-free environment for the owner who doesn't have to worry about making a huge return, huge return and increasing fees to make that return happen. For example, the focus then can be turned towards education quality. So having learned some of this, we've, uh, we invested in Vartana and realized that we could do more with them. And our belief is that we can leverage death, debt further to provide better quality learning to the, to the students. The uh, idea here is to be able to enable a new kind of financing by providing debt along with smart uh, services, along with some reward and recognition, which enables the underlying borrowers to focus on quality and be able to make a, give a return to investors that they can afford and be rewarded for education quality. So performance linked reward system can be enforced through a debt structure. And that's the underlying thought process behind the financing method that we are going to discuss here. Next, please. So if you, if you uh, as we head towards the role of debt, uh, debt ultimately can be used very thoughtfully towards creating a blended finance structure. The issue today that we face is that there is a significant shortage, 200 trillion, I think approximately, in that the UN United Nations is uh, talking about in making our SDG targets happen. Um, unless the private sector participates, that number will be very likely not met. 
So for the private sector to participate, there has to be an incentive in place. And today in the emerging markets, only 49% of private, private capital is making it to the emerging markets. So the, the shortage of capital is not due to the lack of opportunity. It is due to the perceived risk that the emerging markets and the bottom of the pyramid, for example, present to an investor. To de-risk and to catalyze private sector capital, it is critical that we have blended finance structures, such as the one here, where blended finance takes on the first loss, also provides support towards rewards and recognition, thereby freeing up the burden of rewards and recognition and first loss and enabling the private capital uh, investors to make a decent return. And that's been observed uh, quite a few times. So let me give you some simple rudimentary mathematics around that. If a grant provider in the past had to give a hundred rupees to uh, overall in a year to a bunch of uh, affordable schools, now it's possible that they could and that would go to, let's say about 10 schools. Today, they can actually go to a point where they can give 10 rupees, same 10 schools benefit because the other 90 is coming from private capital. Their 10 is now working for still 10 schools. And so they can apply the same 100 if the budget does not reduce to many, many more schools, 10 times as many schools. And that's the multiplier effect in very rudimentary terms that blended finance can provide. And as we go through uh, significant market cycles, now pandemic cycles and other cycles, debt, uh, grant capital will not always be available. It's not going to be endless. It's going to shrink. It's going to find multiple other avenues for use. So as we go through these cycles, we must be more thoughtful about how to leverage grants to provide a better private capital opportunities. Next slide, please, Summer. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll skip this one uh, in the interest of time and I'll come back, to, come back to one last case study, I think, which is more important. So, um, so, un, so we have been working on putting together uh, in, in partnership with a multilateral agency, a uh, new blended finance project in South Africa. We just got news this morning and I think uh, everybody would be, uh, Steve's part of this consortium that we put together that we've been selected just today for, for, for this particular project by this US multilateral. And that's great because we are now going to be in a position where we can first, we can create a first loss and rewards support program through this entity, catalyze local donor support, which is critical because local donors understand that market niche much better than anybody else. They've been supporting it for years and now they can, they can also be further leveraged, uh, get to private capital, use the private capital to lend to institutions directly or to financial intermediaries and use that to educate the owners about rewards, recognition and value of services and ensuring that we conduct a pre-assessment of the learning quality and that's done in partnership with a third party provider and get to a point where we can engage improvement services. We necessarily as the managers won't engage the services our desire would be that the owner of school puts skin in the game with an eye on the rewards and significant rewards, not five, 10% improvement, but significant like 30, 40% uh, reimbursement. With that eye, they would want to theoretically invest in some services, leadership training, teacher training, improvement services, et cetera. And that will result in a better overall learning environment and better learning outcomes and ultimately result in rewards being recognized, rewards being delivered, recognition taking place. So what that does at the very bottom, the right side is cut off, is uh, re hopefully results in a sustainable system where the system won't just depend on grants. It will actually at some time be able to use the interest capital and use part of that interest from the private investors and give that as rewards. So the grant owners don't have to be part of the system anymore. And we've run some numbers around this and it seems to work. Uh, so that's where we are headed with this. So that's where we are, Summer. Thank you and uh, over to you. Thanks, Sandeep. Maybe just one quick question in terms of putting this instrument together in your South Africa experience. Like what was the biggest challenge that you faced? I think the biggest challenge was understanding the ground reality and 
getting to see it from the same lens as uh, the government of South Africa, whom we interact with, the uh, multilateral agency, us, and the owners or entrepreneurs on the ground. So four parties had to view the problem from the same lens and agree that the problem was worth tackling. That took several months of effort. So yeah, I think that was the biggest challenge. And my colleague Nirav is in the audience. He might have a, a deeper answer, but I think we can ask him to provide that through me if he likes, but thank you. Good. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, so, Steve, maybe I will hand uh, the reins over to you. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about Vatana, you know, the work that you've been doing, and specifically, I think, you know, how you've been bringing innovative approaches to bear right from the very heart of your business, which is actually an innovative financing approach, uh, and, you know, some of the experiments that you've tried, uh, what your experience has been there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to all the panelists. Great. Always learning from all of you guys. Um, uh, yeah, so at Vartana, we're quite simple. For the last seven years, we've just been focused on primarily serving affordable private schools through loans and then support to the school owners, uh, both in terms of academic um, uh, solutions and management solutions to help improve the quality and uh, capacity of schools, low-cost low private schools. So we've been doing this for about seven years and we've lent to um, about 5,000 schools, some 10,000 loans we've dispersed totaling $250 million um, over the course of this time and are actively working today with about 4,000 schools. And that's roughly a little less than 3 million students at the, the schools that are being served. Um, and uh, so, uh, it, you know, as you kind of alluded to, I think at the time when we started and uh, Rajesh, my partner and I were involved in even uh, an earlier business that was really um, probably kind of the innovation was just simply that we would lend to low cost private schools that were not getting much financing. And there wasn't a ton of, you know, uh, real brainy financial innovation. There it was mainly just a, the ability to understand the risk and underwrite and, and support schools that uh, looked a little different than a standard business to, to a lot of lenders. Um, so it's been great to see how innovation then starts to become mainstream because I will say that one thing that's changed over the last few years is that many more lenders have come to enter into this market that don't necessarily focus on this market but are, are broad-based lenders and have come to accept uh, this as a viable commercial market. So uh, that's been interesting to see, both positive and then also challenging because uh, they, they try and keep us honest and, and offer a lot of competition. Um, I think in terms of, of this panel, what would be helpful in building on what Emily and Maya were talking about uh, is uh, we have also um, offered a kind of reward-based uh, financing to schools and then in turn received that in partnership with MSDF. And so what we basically designed was a program where we have a, a school transformation program where we intervene with schools to improve learning outcomes. And this is through teacher interventions, student interve interventions, sometimes even parent interventions. And what we set up and what we realized with schools, um, when you invest in quality, that's a, a short term right now expense that you incur. And though most schools you know, believe that's the right thing to do, usually the benefits of that quality come at a very long tail lag, um, both in terms of just the learning outcomes increasing and then even more than that, the perception in the market and what have you changing such that people, you know, more students come or they pay higher fees. So you have this tough dilemma, even for school owners who want to do the right thing. So what we um, designed into our program was that, um, and because there was assessments built into this program, if you improved at a certain level of, of learning outcomes, we would offer a 5% rebate on your Varthana loan. So we would forgive 5% of the outstanding principal. And if you hit a stretch target, which was a pretty aggressive improvement in learning outcomes from the norm, we would forgive 10% of your loan. And so what we wanted to do is translate into a very short-term tangible financial benefit to schools that were prioritizing learning outcomes. Um, and then what was very ex exciting for us is MSDF came alongside and they provided uh, a big kind of wholesale financing to Varthana which had a variable interest rate component, such that the more we paid out in rebates to schools, 
the less interest we paid on our um, MSDF loan. And so what this meant to us as a for-profit company was that our financial picture kind of netted out to being neutral. So that my hard-nosed uh, commercial investors like Sandeep over here wouldn't get frustrated that we were bleeding heart social guys and not minding the commercial side. Um, and yet the schools in the end were the, the ones on the ground receiving this benefit. Um, and I, I think, you know, MSDF has done some interesting case studies on this. And um, there was a similar type of project done where rewards were given without any interventions. And I think what, what the data has shown is that this combination of, you know, providing some tangible rewards, but then pairing that with interventions um, that directly try and serve the schools has, has really made a very powerful difference in the, the rate of improvement of learning outcomes. Um, so that's, that's been quite a, exciting. And I think to Sandeep's point around efficiency, if you look at that from a philanthropic perspective, the loan that uh, MSDF gave us was given at a commercial rate. Um, and we'll pay it all back with principal and interest. And in the best case scenario or worst case scenario from a financial picture for them, what will happen is they'll, we'll pay them a few hundred basis points less of interest. Um, which will still be paying them interest and all the principal back. So um, all of that, the business has been built on commercial capital and debt capital. So when you think about, you know, like Sandeep was saying, how precious philanthropy is, um, this is a lot of kind of bang for your buck, if you will, for what actually ends up being the subsidy. It's really built on a lot of commercial capital. And so the, the, the multiplier rate, if you will, is quite high on that for the impact, which is one of the things I'm constantly obsessed with his efficiency at those kinds of levels. Um, I guess quickly, the other thing to mention in terms of COVID and how this is affecting us, um, uh, and I think uh, Maya touched on this uh, very clearly is, you know, the schools have been incredibly disrupted uh, in terms of their standard operating procedure for classes. And so what we've been doing, it's kind of, we're very uniquely positioned to have such a big outreach to schools and yet to have a team that is able to deliver academic uh, solutions. And so we've worked to bundle together um, some very practical, low cost, sensible ways of delivering remote education to schools. And we're offering this uh, free of cost to our whole uh, client base and getting them uh, online with being able to offer uh, parents at home an ability to you know, extend education to kids. And uh, you know, this is important all the way through to keeping the kids on track with their academics. Um, on up to the level of uh, allowing the schools to continue to charge fees and survive this thing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are providing financing to help um, enable them and to the extent that any investments are required in technology and those kinds of things to be able to do this. Um, we're trying to position ourselves to be able to provide this ongoing financing to help schools kind of relaunch in the midst of this crisis and covering working capital needs, even if their fees are being disrupted. Um, so that's all happening in real time. Um, and I think if we think longer term, the kind of things that um, for us would be very helpful, um, first and foremost is um, there's actually, I think, fewer people playing on the for-profit pay for results side. Maybe Emily and Maya can correct me if I'm mistaken, but um, it seems to me like most of the, the big high profile stuff is, is more on the pure impact bond uh, for, for philanthropic entities. but um, it would be great, you know, our order of magnitude is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So we would have an appetite to eat up, you know, whatever people would want to offer. And I think it could be paired with commercial investors uh, as well so that people could just provide the, the interest rate discount. So that would be on my kind of uh, wish list for longer term. And then the other thing that I don't know how many people are watching from the government side, but it's actually not easy to go cross border into India with a variable rate instrument. Um, so there's a lot of in the weeds complication stuff that isn't gonna, ever going to make it to a discussion like this, but it's not easy to do. And MSDF, God bless them, a lot of effort and kind of in the lab uh, to make it all the, the mechanics actually work out cross-border here in India. Thanks, Steve. Um, maybe just quickly I'd go around the panel to say, what's the one word or phrase in your mind? Like, how are you feeling about this work? And, you know, how do you feel about it really at this point in time with lots of uncertainty, but also lots of opportunity looking forward? Maybe I will go with you, Maya, first. 
I mean, as I said, I think there's a huge opportunity now for a, for a paradigm shift. I, I do believe, and I, I'll echo what Sandeep said, I think blended finance really has a key role to play in bringing philanthropic and development capital as a way to mobilize additional commercial capital. So I think blended finance is, I think, a, a, an area that will grow uh, in the future. The other thing that I'll say is the importance of building an enabling ecosystem. And, and there I think that Again, philanthropy um, and, and some donors can play a role in you know, sharing best practices, bringing a, a knowledge sharing platforms, um, providing um, you know, technical assistance, but then also acting as this uh, first loss uh, guarantee. So I would say scale, enabling ecosystem and blended finance, if I had to leave three words for people to, to remember. Emily, any last words that you would like to leave with the group on how are you feeling about this work going forward? Sure. The, the piece that I think is, is really important is that um, adaptive learning and uh, performance management aspect. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about sort of these, some of these instruments are very costly or take a lot of resources or time to develop, but I, I think that the process is the hard work that needs to be done and that it's about system building up systems and really focusing on uh, the data that needs to be collected to understand what's working and what's not working. And yeah, that's the hard work that, that, that has to be done so that we can achieve those outcomes. Um, and so that's what, that's what I would like to leave, leave this with is I think we need to be serious about investing in those systems of data collection, analysis, monitoring, and evaluation so that yeah. we can understand better what's working and what's not working. Sandeep, anything on your wish list? Yeah, so I think I'd uh, quickly answer a question here as well and part of my wish list, right? I think uh, people are uh, worried about a lot with education, learning quality with technology. I don't know exactly if we can find a solution to take technology to the bottom of the pyramid. That's my biggest wish list. Because answering the second question as part of it, um, I think technology-led teaching, if done right, is probably as effective, if not more effective, than just teacher-led teaching. Uh, we can debate that, discuss that, but this is an opinion which I've acquired by looking at the teaching methods that one can follow. Uh, when you pair uh, human-led, teacher-led online learning in piecemeal fashion and manage assessments through the process. It can be equally effective is my assertion. So I would love to find a way to take technology to the bottom of the pyramid and be able to make sure that we can bridge the learning gap by, not, by, by making the digital gap go away. So there has to be a way. For example, in the Philippines, Facebook is free on the carriers. You can use Facebook Live to teach. I don't know, we, we must have something like that in India. We should have that. Why can't we have that? Um, so anyway, that's it. That's my wish list. Thank you for having me. All right, so I just wanna say a big thank you to our panel for joining us. And uh, if you could just stay back for a few minutes and try and answer some of the questions on the chat. I know there are not very many on innovative financing, but if each of you could just pick one question. Thank you so much for your time. It was fantastic to speak to all of you and uh, looking forward to an exciting year and many more blended finance to come. Thank you, Samar. Thank you. Thank you.